Good morning. All the noises from Whitehall and Brussels suggest that we are at last close to a Brexit divorce deal. But ironically, just at the same moment, the Electoral Commission announces it has referred part of the unofficial Leave campaign to the National Crime Agency to investigate if it has broken the law. If that turned out to be true, if, it would be political dynamite. I'm joined this morning by the man now being investigated, Aaron Banks. What was the source of the £8 million he passed to leave.eu? Listening to him and responding on behalf of the government to the budget as well is the Cabinet Minister in charge of Housing and Communities, James Brokenshire. Also, here in the studio, I'm joined by the German ambassador, Peter Wittig, to get another perspective on Brexit, but also to talk about a momentous moment in European politics, the beginning of the end of the Angela Merkel era. And another continental voice of a very different kind, the award-winning British artist and filmmaker Steve McQueen, who now lives in Amsterdam, has been talking about his new crime heist film. Your girl's happy to split your cut. Split our cut? It's equal or nothing. You vouch for her? I don't require a vouch. You really need another gun. I got my own. You need to watch how you talk to me. Plus, we've got some glorious music from English National Opera's hit revival of the peerless Porgy and Bess. Reviewing the papers today, Julia Hartley Brewer from Talk Radio. To keep an eye on the midterm elections in the United States, Dr. Leslie Vinjamuri, an American specialist at the Chatham House think tank, and Labour's Shadow Minister for Early Years, Tracy Brabin. All of that and more, but first the news with Roger Johnson. Hello, good morning. Surrey police say that seven of the eight children who were injured after falling from a giant inflatable slide have now been released from hospital. The incident happened at a fireworks display in Woking Park in Surrey last night, where a major incident was declared. The health and safety executive is investigating. Sir so Jeremy Haywood, the former Cabinet Secretary and Head of the Civil Service, has died of cancer at the age of 56. Downing Street has announced that news in the past hour. The Prime Minister, Theresa May, said Sir Jeremy had worked tirelessly to serve our country and that his death was a huge loss to British public life. Sir Jeremy stepped aside in June to receive treatment before formally retiring last month. Players and officials from Leicester City Football Club are due to land in Thailand this morning to pay their respects to the club's owner, who died in a helicopter crash last weekend, along with four others. The team beat Cardiff 1-0 in its first game since the incident. It was an emotional match with many players and fans in tears. All of this weekend's Premier League games will be preceded by a minute's silence or applause, and players will wear black armbands in remembrance. Two days before the midterm elections in the United States, President Trump has embarked on a final burst of campaigning. At rallies in Montana and Florida, he said that the Democrats wanted to flood American communities with illegal immigrants while he was using US soldiers to protect the country. The Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall will visit a cocoa farm in Ghana today as their nine-day tour of West Africa continues. Yesterday, the royal couple received a warm reception in the capital city, Accra, after a private meeting with the president of Ghana and a visit to a castle used during the slave trade era. The public vote on X Factor had to be cancelled last night after a problem with the sound. It's thought to be the first time that voting has been cancelled in the singing show's 15-year history. Viewers complained that some performances were distorted and contestants sounded like Daleks. ITV has apologised and said the vote will take place on tonight's programme instead. That's it from me. The next news here on BBC One is at half past 12. Now back to you, Andrew. Many thanks, Roger. And to the front pages, as usual, there's the Sunday Times. May's secret Brexit deal, they say they've got all the details of that. Number 10, pouring a little bit of cold water on it, but not gallons. Uh, the Sunday Telegraph there's got an interview with Matt Hancock, the new health secretary, suggesting that companies should give their staff free fruit and bicycle loans to keep them fit. 
the Mail on Sunday has a story about a rivalry number 10 and the BBC. I have to say that after 40 years or thereabouts in the business, this is less news than a fact of daily life. <laughs> anyway, on to the Observer. They've got a story about Aaron Banks. Uh, and his insurance company workers also working on the Leave.eu campaign. We'll be talking to him, of course, later on. And then, finally, the Sunday People. There's a big row on government, in government after the resignation of Tracy Crouch, the minister, over gambling machines, and they're focusing on that story. So, as I say, much to talk about. Julie, let's start with the, the Sunday Times splash. And Lots and lots of stuff inside about the Brexit deal. Yes, absolutely. I mean, if, at a cursory read, you think, oh, wow, there is a deal, and, and the Sunday Times has got the exclusive, and, and certainly the political editor, Tim Shipman, has contacts second to none. Uh, you say number 10 are pouring a little bit of cold water. They poured an awful lot more than that over it, mm -hmm. uh, I think, uh, behind the scenes. Uh, they're saying that there is no secret deal. Uh, the idea is basically there's been this huge breakthrough on the Irish border and that they won't have to have checks on our, on our other natural border. They can do checks yeah. at factories and shop floors. Of course, what us Brexiteers have been suggesting for a very long time. But the idea that the, this, this backstop, this uh, customs backstop, um, uh, for, for the Irish backstop would actually be a UK-wide backstop. Of course, not a new idea, one that Downing Street's been putting around for a long time. But it doesn't actually sound like there has been a breakthrough and that there is a deal sitting there ready to be signed. Well, the real question is whether the so-called Irish backstop Stop the really controversial mm. one that would split off Northern Ireland in yep. some respects from the rest of the UK is still there as the end backstop, yeah. the backstop after the backstop. But the idea is to expand that to a UK-wide backstop, but of course that won't please any Brexiteers at all. And we, you talk there about so this, this need to find a compromise, and of course this is where the issue is. You, know, you have referendums on binary issues where there isn't a compromise. There's a little bit pregnant, no, not an option. <laughs> so leave or remain, and this, this desperate bid that Downing Street still have to try and persuade everybody, of course, she's not going to, Theresa May's not going to please either the Rain or the Leave side. What she's going to try and do is, we've seen Project Fear, yeah. Mark 75 coming through this even today with another letter from business leaders desperately saying trying to just push the idea that we're not prepared for a no deal a no deal will be an absolute tra you know tragedy for the country and therefore any deal is better than yes. no deal that's actually the, 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 plan. the there is better mood music around at the moment and the question is of course she, ha she has to sort of sort two problems the deal in brussels but then in the house of commons mm. and trace that's going to be very very difficult for a lot of labor mps because if the, if you are confronted with no deal or this deal that you don't like it's a very hard choice isn't it well certainly we're not going to be bound by a matter of time into um, a no-deal Brexit because it will be catastrophic for our constituents and the country and um, uh, there's obviously going to be as we near uh, March there's lots of uh, uh, pieces from other grandees about um, what their opinion is and uh, well, obviously Tony adds, Blair adds to it all yeah <laughs> Tony Blair whose headline is MPs uh, Labour MPs don't flirt with a lesser uh, evil Brexit. So he's basically saying to all MPs, vote down the deal, force a referendum if you possibly can. That's he's he's hardening his position. Yeah, well, he, well, certainly. I mean, he's in a position where he's no longer accountable to his constituents, and and I have uh, spent uh, m many uh, months talking to my constituents, having roundtables and so on about what they believe. But what our position is is we need to know what is the deal because at the moment. According to the Sunday Times, it's a 50-page document or it's a five-page document. There is no agreement. She's trying to deal and, you know, solve the ERG problem. What When we have the deal, and it's also position at the moment, when we have it, we can then look at our six tests and see if we can uh, agree that that's the best for the country mm. rather than for the Conservative Party. Well, it's going to be uh, very complicated. Mm. Leslie, I'm wondering... Uh, what the view is from across the pond. Are Americans watching this total bafflement? Well, like, you know, Americans... <laughs> Most of us are. Americans, <laughs> Americans look across the pond and they say it's, it's, sort of, it's, it's, it's the moment of, of relief. Uh, taking their eyes off American politics, they can look to the UK and, and many say, well, that's even harder problem, the harder nut to crack than what we're mm -hmm. dealing with. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a sort of, you know, who's more polarised, which country is more divided. Clearly, the politics of division is, is yeah. where we are uh, yeah. in both countries. Before we leave Brexit, there's, there's stuff about Aaron Banks, who I'll be talking to later on across many of the papers. The Observer's got a big story on the front page. But, Julia, there's also a piece about Aaron Banks in the Sunday Times, mm. in, in the middle of which he suddenly says that if it was the vote now, he'd vote to remain because the government's made such a mess I, of it. I imagine view. a somewhat flippant remark from Aaron Banks, knowing, knowing how, how flippant he can be on these things. But certainly the Observer, I mean, I, I, I can't think of a week they don't splash on a story about Aaron Banks, frankly. It's their bread and butter. Yeah. Although it's interesting, also, usually page 46 the next week contains an apology uh, well, forced by the well, lawyers we'll over see. some claim. But we don't know. But this is the thing. I mean, Aaron Banks obviously can answer for himself whether or not he yeah. misled MPs, whether or not there was Russian money. He's been denying it all. I do think on all of this, uh, this is a matter mm. for you know, the National Crime Agency and let's see 
an investigation, if, if there has been wrongdoing, absolutely there should be an investigation of, of anybody involved in yes. any side of the campaign. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's a matter for the courts or the police and, and, and of for course the, for the police have the powers but, to follow the money yes, in the way that nobody else does. But the does. key thing is, of course, is the way that this is being used and exploited by Ramonas, not Ramonas, they accept the result of the referendum, but the exploitation by the, uh, the Ramonas who, who at Lord Adonis well, and others, we'll to try and use this as, a, as an excuse to have yet another referendum which I think is, is frankly laughable and is typical of the EU, which, you know, if you don't vote the right way, we'll make you vote again. All right, well, let's turn to voting again in a different context. The midterm American elections are upon us. Lots and lots of coverage mm. of this, Leslie, in the papers. And a general sense that Trump's standing is not where it ought to be, given where he is in the presidential cycle, that he's a bit below where he should be. Yeah, I mean, the first thing to note is it, it's, it's actually quite extraordinary, the level of coverage that we're getting in the British press of the midterm elections. Normally, the rest of the world doesn't really worry about these particular elections. This president is not popular. Uh, if we look at the post-Cold War period, he's down. He's at around 41 percent right now. Uh, but these elections are very interesting. You know, the Republicans have controlled Congress. Um, for the last two years, and and that is now up for grabs, right? There's a mm. there's a sense that it might it might go the House may well go to the Democrats. Not entirely clear. If you look at a generic ballot across the country, actually the Democrats are up 10 percent. But as we know, the institutions in the U.S. are biased against that popular vote, and so it's a it is an uphill battle. Interesting to note this this particular piece in the Observer. Um, noting what we've all seen, especially in the last few days, the American economy is incredibly strong. And so in some ways, you know, the puzzle is why, given how strong the economy is, why isn't this the number one campaign issue? And also, why isn't uh, President Trump doing much better than he is? Is part of the reason for that the so-called caravan mm. of would-be immigrants moving from Central and Central uh, South America towards the American border? Trump sent down armed uh, soldiers to the border. And there's a sort of a sense that this big immigration issue is being stoked up by both sides as the crunch question. Yeah, I think it is. And here's the interesting thing, right? It's that a lot of what happens in the midterm elections comes down not to what people think. They've, many people, most people have already decided what they think. It's about whether they get out of bed in the yeah. morning or whether they've been going to the polls already and they make that vote. So it's all about turnout. And the decision has clearly been taken that the, that the thing that will mobilize Americans and get them passionate and get them to turn out to the mm. polls, both for the Democrats and for the Republicans, are questions of identity and this is and so it's become very much about immigration and yep. the caravan has taken on the sort of looming presence in the American media for the last several weeks. And of course it's not just America it's happening in Europe too. Mm -hmm. We'll be talking about Angela Merkel later on Tracy but um, she is somebody who was really the dominant figure across mm. Europe, a colossus and then she made um, a political mistake in allowing a million people into Germany and things turned against her very, very fast. Mm. Um, the left and the right moved up and the centre began to implode. And Europe looks a lot different as a result. And you could even argue that Brexit had something of the same dynamics mm -hmm. behind it too. I mean, certainly, it, this is in the Observe. It's their focus piece. Uh, Brexit is just a sideshow of EU mired in crisis. I mean, I, I absolutely agree with you. When Barack Obama did his final trip, I mean, yeah. uh, Angela Merkel was his final visit. And, he, you know, they obviously had a fantastic relationship. She's been a, a, a very phenomenal politician, but there are other issues to be, you know, to be looked at uh, across Europe, which is, you know, the uh, standard of living for young people. And um, this has meant that there has been a far, you know, the rise in the far right, these swaggering men who are talking quite polarised language. But, and, you know, you can't get away from the fact that, you know, Orban is, uh, is basically a fascist and, you know, it is deeply mm. worrying for, for Europe. No, I, mean, yeah. I would argue that the likes of Angela Merkel, that she just handed that to them by that catastrophic mistake to, to open the borders. Uh, no one, as with, as with mass immigration to this country from Eastern Europe uh, by under Tony Blair's government, no one bothered to ask the people. And it's funny enough, people like to have a say in how their country is run and who lives in it. Mm. And they will punish the politicians who don't let them have a say. And that's simply what we're seeing. This is, this is actually, again, whether you like the people who are being voted for or not, we, 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 you know, we shouldn't be criticising Democrats choices. Uh, a lot of the, the, the political elite do this an awful lot of the time. If you believe that every person, every man, every woman should have a vote, 
um, let them have their vote and trust yeah. that they make the right decisions. But it is deeply troubling. These sinister forces are there's, rising. No, I think deeply lot, troubling is yeah. to just invite a million people well, into the country without asking for me. I think that's more deeply troubling. The problem, of course, is that you don't, you, the, the information is being skewed. So it's very difficult for people to make a choice about immigration when they're being told immigrants cause crime, yeah. mm -hmm. immigrants turn up, don't turn up to courts, one of Trump's key, uh, key claims, which is actually simply untrue. And so if you go through the facts... They're simply well, not being presented in the in the media and, and across the public. But I think the, the American media and the British media are very different, and oh, European media are different on that front. Let's let's turn to uh, there's another couple of stories we'd like to talk about, Tracy. There's on your beef, on your watch, as it were, your um your brief, not your beef, probably your beef and your brief. <laughs> vegans, vegans, <laughs> let's do. Yeah, vegans, if you're watching, <laughs> turn away now. Um, it's a story yes. about about it's the budget a, effect uh, on children. It's in uh, Daily Mail, and it's Hammond's boost for children falls. Uh, 400 million short. Um, in the budget, there was a, quite a song and dance about the money he was giving for children's services and adult social care. But um, uh, our team have discovered that actually there's been an, un, uh, an overspend by local yeah. councils of 800 million, which means that even if all the money that... And yet it is new money. I mean, it is new money coming it, it in. Is, it is new money, but actually if you cut from the one side... Um, council budgets, like in Kirkley's, 50%, and then expect them to, to mm. fund a rising crisis in children's services. You know, children, the most vulnerable children, are the victims of austerity. Yeah. And you have to actually put the money in at the beginning, mm. and you have to sure. give the money properly to councils, or otherwise you get Northampton. Well, we'll be going to be talking to Mr Brokenshire from the Cabinet mm -hmm. later about all these subjects, but yet another Cabinet Minister all over the front page of the yeah. Telegraph, Sunday Telegraph. It's very rare that you get fruit in a front page <laughs> yeah. head, splash yeah. headline. Yes, yeah, Sunday Telegraph, give a staff a free fruit, and this is a, an exclusive interview with Matt Hancock, the Health Secretary, uh, talking about firms need to be, do more to get their, their workers healthy and also bring them back into work after they've gone off from, uh, with, with, with health problems. And I think that's well and good, other than the fact it feels a very nanny state to me. I'm not entirely sure that it's my boss's job, whether I'm in a fit and healthy state, either mentally or physically, uh, to go to work. It's his, job, his or her job to, to pay me to do a job, and it's mm. my responsibility to make sure I'm fit to do that job. You think mm. we're piling too much onto private yes. companies, as well, it were. Stuff too much onto, the... I, it's about personal responsibility. You should, you know, if you want to be healthy, be healthy. If you're not healthy, you can't work, well, tough. But also it's about paying conditions and well-being in the workplace. So if you don't know whether you're going to work tomorrow, and Apple's not going to no. do no. it, is no. it? Well, we're all very healthy. We're all working very hard <laughs> this morning. Thanks. Thanks to all of you, and so to the weather. The weather news, as reported this week, was that global warming is propelling us into an era of more extreme weather. It hasn't felt like that, this week at least. Dullish and rainy, and then brightish and fresher. It is exactly what we would expect at the beginning of November. I wonder what the outlook is like for firework night tomorrow. Over to Matt Taylor in the weather studio. Hi there, Andrew. Well, certainly milder than it was through last week. And the week ahead will be uh, much milder as well. But let's go with it. We'll have a bit of rain at times. The rain today is mainly across parts of England and Wales. Some heavier bursts towards the southwest at the moment, also affecting parts of southern and western Wales later, and extending through the Midlands towards parts of Yorkshire and Lincolnshire in particular. But the far southeast corner, East Anglia, dry and bright, and Scotland, Northern Ireland, much better day today compared with yesterday. A lot more sunshine around. Winds not quite as strong, still touching gale force in the far north and west. But uh, with those uh, lighter winds, temperatures at around 13 or 14 degrees, especially in the sunny moments, shouldn't feel too bad. Now, as we go into this evening and overnight, a bit of patchy rain working its way across northern England, but heaviest of the rain will be out to the western fringes of England, Wales, and then developing into Northern Ireland and southwest Scotland later. Temperatures a little lower than recent nights, but clear of a frost, so not too chilly to start tomorrow morning. As for the early rises, well, wet start in Northern Ireland, western and northern Scotland tomorrow morning, improving through the day, but staying fairly cloudy with the odd splash of rain. One or two showers to the west of England and Wales, maybe the odd isolated one through eastern counties of England, but much of uh, eastern Scotland, good part of England, eastern Wales stay dry and temperatures on the rise again, up to around 16 degrees for one or two. And overall, uh, Andrew, it will be a mild week, typically autumnal, though, with some wet and windy weather at times too. Back to you. There you go, exactly as expected. Now, Peter Wittig, Germany's ambassador to London, came here from Washington, and he's one of the best connected of German diplomats. He joins me now to reflect on a remarkable moment in German and continental European politics, the beginning of the end of the Anglo Merkel era. Welcome, Mr. Wittig. Um, there's, there's a piece in one of the papers talking to CDU party members, young party members, very active, who can't remember anybody except Angela Merkel running the party. She has been a colossal figure in German politics, hasn't she? Well, she has. I mean, uh, mind you, she has been at the helm of her party for 18 years, and she has been chancellor 
of uh, Germany for 13 years. So uh, she is a colossal figure. And now she has started a transition process in her party. And she has initiated um, a, a process of uh, renewal for her party. But she made clear that she remains chancellor in her fourth term. I suppose the question is, for how long does she remain chancellor? Because there are suggestions that um, at the European elections um, early next year, if her party doesn't do well, she will have to stand aside then as well, chancellor. Well, she has said that she wants to serve out her term, her fourth term, and Germans price and honour stability, and I think there's no appetite in the coalition and beyond uh, for any dramatic disruption uh, right now. Um, she has a mandate, and she will be an influential figure on the European stage. She has now more time to devote herself to those big challenges. For the Brexit process, as far as we are concerned, no change. Um, and she remains a reliable, as Germany does, a reliable close friend of, of Britain. We were talking in, in the paper review about that moment when she opened Germany's borders to a million migrants as being a turning point for her. Do you think that is widely regarded in Germany as being a big mistake that she made? Well, that was a turning point for Europe as a whole. Mind you, in 2015-16, uh, this was the biggest movement of people since the Second World War. It was not a voluntary um, mm. development to take in uh, all kinds of people. It was triggered by the instability, war and chaos in Syria. So that was the situation. It came upon Europe and she took the courageous decision to take in refugees. And um, a but different story is the immigration policy. And that's now a big and open and controversial and vivid debate all over uh, Germany. And I'm glad we're having that debate. But uh, looking to what happened to her and the rise of alternative for Deutschland and so on in Germany, no European leader ever again is going to allow in that number of refugees at once, are they? They're going to look at that experience that Angela Merkel had and said, never again. Well, we've got to distinguish between refugees yeah. and immigration. Sure. Refugees, uh, we are bound by the Refugee uh, Convention. Uh, we want to be um, you know, a humanitarian-based country. Um, we, we want to adhere to the international law. On immigration, we've got to distinguish. We can't uh, take in all the economic migrants we want. We have got to be more robust here. And I think uh, this is where our debate is heading. We have a new right-wing anti-immigration party. But at the same time, we see a spectacular rise of the Green Party, who is very much pro-liberal immigration. It's what's happening around the world. The centre is imploding a bit, and, and the, the left and the right are on the rise. Yes, but I'm sure um, that Germany, which has been governed for 70 years after the Second World War, out of the centre, will continue to be a country that is governed from the centre, centre-left or centre-right. What do you think this means for Europe as a whole? Because there is a kind of European reform agenda being driven very hard at the moment by President Macron of France, and he has been looking to Angela Merkel as his great ally in all of this. Without her so strong, does that European reform process start to stumble, do you think? Chancellor Merkel will be a force to reckon with on the European stage. She has been frequently underestimated. And I tell those people who, who, who want to write her off, don't. She will be a force on the European stage. There is a reform agenda together with the French president. We want to make Europe um, more competitive. Uh, we need to, to focus on the core business, internal, external security, um, defense, uh, foreign policy, uh, also fiscal alignment. So there are lots of things to do we can do together. And Germany and France usually work together. Of course, we can't lead the European Union alone. There are 27 uh, member states and everybody has a say. Mm. But if the two uh, countries agree, uh, Germany and France, we can make uh, progress. That was always the case, still the case. Let me ask you about Brexit, because you're a man with your ear mm. close to the ground. Mm. There is a sense that we are moving towards an exit deal just at the moment. Is that your sense? Well, we have resolved 90 or 95 percent of that withdrawal agreement. The most intractable issue, as you know, is the Northern Irish question, um, the, the backstop. Here, there is a willingness of the 27 and um, the Commission uh, to show flexibility. 
Uh, we don't want to uh, jeopardize the peace in Northern Ireland, nor do we want to see the reemergence of a hard border, but that there is a political will to come to a negotiated settlement and forge a new relationship, uh, which is, should be as close as possible uh, with uh, Britain and, and Germany um, has a vital interest in coming to an agreement. Uh, you, of course, run, happily for you, a large trade surplus with us at the moment. How worried is German manufacturing industry in general, and I guess the car industry in particular, about the outcome which could be described as a no-deal Brexit? That is a consideration, but I tell you also the business community thinks strategically. Where will we be in five or ten years? Will the integrity of the single market be uh, salvaged? Can it be uh, kept intact? That's the perspective. There is, there is an argument that actually Europe, the EU area, has been growing relatively slowly over the past couple of decades compared with other parts of the world and that it needs a different kind of model and that therefore simply focusing only on the single market may be the wrong direction to be taking. Is there any sense in Germany that we, it may be time for a different economic model? Well, we've had, we've had a great economic run and we're still having it and we are an export orientated uh, country um, and the countries around us due uh, and thanks to the single market our, are our greatest uh, export uh, destinations. So the single market has is crucial. is crucial and has been a guarantor of stability and prosperity in Europe. Ambassador, thanks very much indeed for talking to us today. And now a look at the Sunday politics where you are. What's coming up straight after this programme? In Sunday Politics London, people living on the boundaries of the capital's boroughs receive worse services than those in the centre. So should the borough model change? And knife crime has increased in London by 52%. Permanent school exclusions are up 40%. So are exclusions a factor driving violence? Aaron Banks made the single biggest donation in British political history when he passed £8 million to the unofficial Brexit campaign. This week, he was referred by the Electoral Commission to the National Crime Agency, which investigates serious and organised crime. In particular, the Commission doesn't believe Mr Banks when he says that he was the real source of that money. He's with me now. Were you the real source of that money? Well, thank you for having me on, first of all. Of course I was. The money came from a UK-registered company. It was generated from cash, generated from businesses in the UK. And the whole misunderstanding revolves around the role of Rock Holdings as a holding company. Well, and before we start, I'd just like to say, absolutely, for the record, there was no Russian money and no interference of any type. All right, well, let's follow the I money, I just want to be absolutely clear about that. So, where did the money come from? It went, yeah. When it went into leave.eu's yeah. accounts, where yeah. did the money come from? The money then? came from Rock Services, which was a UK limited company. It was generated out of insurance uh, business uh, written in the UK. It was contrary to some of the press reports in the FT and other <laughs> Remain Lean in publications. We insure nearly right. half a million customers a year, the size of Manchester. We turn over £250 million of premium. It's a sizable business. Well, I'll come on to that in a moment. I'm but just, just making clear where just, it came from. Just to, just to clear out where it came yeah. from. So, Rock Services yeah. is what we call a shell company. It doesn't do much of its own, does it? Well, it's a service company, uh, but it's a UK-based service company. company. It, it doesn't generate that it, kind of money. I'm telling you that it came from insurance uh, business written in the UK. Mm. So, Rock Holdings is a holding company based in the Isle of Man that owns Rock Services. So... Um, did any of the money coming into the Leave.eu come, come from Rock Holdings? Well, that's where I'm confused with the Electoral Commission referring this to the police. We've not, not been asked by the Electoral Commission to actually produce our bank statements. I think we have produced them to your show. You... And what is absolutely clear is it's a holding company, and during 15 and 16, there were no sizable amounts of money went into Rock Holdings. It is not possible for the any money to have come from Rock Holdings to Rock Services. So Rock Holdings was not connected in any way to money going into leave.eu? No, absolutely not. It all came from Rock Services? Correct. Now, you told the MPs that the money came from, quote, another company that I own. Which other company was it? Oh, I've said that Rock Services is where the money came from. It was generated from insurance profits made there. Well, you, you, t you told MPs that... Uh, Rock Services just delivers the cash. The yep. actual loan came from another one of my companies. I ask again, what was the other company? Well, the structure of uh, the, the, the company is that Rock Holdings is the holding company. 
that is the owner of a number of different companies, Rock Services, Southern Rock Insurance, and other other, other businesses. So I ask so, you, but I'm so saying, what but I'm was saying, the company that gave you the I'm loan? I'm saying that you know it's UK generated cash from my group of companies. There was no money came from the Isle of Man Rock Holdings. That is what is a question with the Electoral Commission. Well, the Electoral Commission simply doesn't believe you about that. Well, then why haven't they asked for the bank statements? Well, the you, company, they're, they're questioning it. You've given me the bank statements, you know, but it's I, only a snapshot I mean, and if some you, of it's redacted. It if, doesn't really prove anything. Well, I, you can have the unredacted uh, copy if you want. But it's not fair well, to put you, people's you, bank details there, is it? Uh, you know, and it, we don't know how many bank redacted. accounts Rock Holdings but has. But in any event, Andrew, what, well, well you, you, you could keep on going on that line of question yeah. forever, couldn't you? Why not? <laughs> in, in a sense, in, I mean, Rock Holdings, but let's I want be to, honest, I want to put Isle of you... Man Company, which is right. opaque. Yeah. I want to put Why you... Is it I want to, I want to, well, the Isle of Man Holding Company owns international businesses and it owns businesses in the UK. Mm. You know, the Remain, camp but the Remain campaign got money from what? Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan... That's irrelevant No, it's not irrelevant. It's irrelevant to this. They are, this is about right, what money on. went into well, leave.eu and where it came from. I disagree. It's not from. irrelevant because those are foreign-owned entities that own UK subsidiaries. We went to a QC to get the loan structure signed off, yeah. and he signed it off. And well, we put it forward in the in, in I've, the right, I've, right I've, I've, I've seen that judgment, and okay. the point is, he doesn't refer to either Rock yeah. Holdings okay. or Rock Services. It was about so a different re, issue. I want to read. I'm no. asking you again. I've where did the you. money come from? Rock Services. I and where did the money that. come in? So the money we came to Rock Services. We have from an where? insurance business that generates a large amount of cash, twenty to twenty-five million pounds a year. We insure half a million customers. So this is the now same I want company. To, I want to they made a loss of thirty-two million pounds in twenty sixteen. Well, you're referring to a different company then. You're referring to Southern Rock Insurance that so made which, forty-two million the year before. So which company is this that you're, you're referring to now? You're, you're, which is the company? I'm that saying you're Rock Services about. did not. You, you just so made I'm, a number I'm just up. I'm asking there. you, what is the money? You've literally just made a number up. No, I haven't made a number Rock up. Rock Services did not lose thirty-two million pounds last year. I'm reading Financial Times copy for yes, June. Yes, of course you are. The Gibraltar-based insurance company yes. owned by Aaron Banks made a loss of £32 yeah. million pounds in 2016. That is not Rock Services. The previous year to that, it made £42 million. It's a series this of inter This is the Southern Rock Insurance It's the Southern Rock Insurance I don't, I don't want to get heated with you. No, you're talking, heated. You're just, talking, I'm just yeah, asking you just where Andrew, the You're talking from. about two different things there. The, the, the loan... Sorry, the, the money came from Rock Services went to leave.eu. That's yes. a UK-based company that had the cash to donate it. But in a sense, that doesn't really tell us well, anything. Now unless asking, we know where the uh, money came into now you're trying to, services from. You know, say, well, I need to understand all of your finances. Yeah, Why? In, in a sense, because we, we need to know where the money came from. Well, there are lots of people let who me don't think you're okay. as rich as you say you well, are and don't really believe it's your money and it came know, from somewhere else. So BDO valued our business at £250 million in November 17 right. based on an EBITDA of something like £32 million which I'll happily provide that sort of valuation. But I want to read to you what the Electoral Why Commission... Why can't you give us the account? Why can't you show get a word money? in edgeways here? All right, come on then. It says, this is from the Electoral Commission. I'm concerned that the only source of information is at best hearsay evidence. They describe me as enfant terrible. They go on to say this is a fish, potentially a fishing expedition and, he, and the case officer says, I do not think an investigation would be appropriate. But now they've, they've, they've changed their mind and they no, did investigate on, hold on. you. And you, and you, were, you were found yeah. guilty of misreporting. Yeah, yeah and I'm just going to come on to that. So that's their initial position. They then go on to say, in addition, we will need to yeah. write to Stephen Kinnett to advise of our decision to investigate. This is a politically motivated... It's, it's uh, not. This is, this is all irrelevant. This is the Electoral Commission have gone into your... I'm sorry, they this have, is not have, irrelevant. Then why didn't they ask me for bank statements and rock holdings? Well, I don't know why they didn't, but... Well, you tell me. Certainly the National Crime Agency can look well, at all the, of these things the and will crime, can presumably the National follow crime the money. National Crime Agency have had a referral from an electoral commission to investigate this. We're happy with that. We're going to cooperate with them. Mm. But I'm telling you that the electoral okay. commission did not ask for our bank statements. Why? To really resolve this, we Go need on. the paper trail of the money that went into leave.eu, and we haven't got that. We haven't seen the money coming into leave.eu, and we don't I'm know sorry, where the money came... That's all been evidence to the electoral commission. Well, the whole thing. We, we, have, we have seen no documents well, you, showing the money show, coming in. But, well, it's not that. the almighty arbiter of <laughs> the Electoral Commission law. We sent this to the Electoral Commission. Well, I mean, in another point, the by the way, they fined us for overspending. They said, well, we overspent by 10% of the 750. They then, in court papers, when we've taken them to mm -hmm. court, say, there appears to be a transcription error. 
in the a sense... The 77,000 is now 55,000. This is all getting too complicated. Yeah, well, it would eight be million, now. You eight, just want to smear me. No, I don't want to smear yeah, you. I want do. to know. £8 million, yeah. pounds, biggest donation in British political yeah. history, came from companies involved with you, interleave.eu. Where did the money Andrew, originally come from? It's not from? like I'm using a super injunction to try and hide my Where did here. the money I'm originally come from? I'm telling you, it came from? from a UK company which that had company? cash generated in the UK. Which We've UK evidenced company? That, uh, Rock Services. We've evidenced that to the Electoral Rock Commission. Rock Services is a shell company. It doesn't generate you money. You just said it's a shell company. You just read the FT. Well, well no, I, mean, I don't. The FT, I, I mean, the we, FT, we go along to companies' I mean, house and I mean, we look. the FT, by the way, in their analysis... We go along to companies' house and we look. The FT, in their analysis of my business affairs, missed out a whole company that supplies nearly 85% of the underwriting of my business. They select... Let, let's be honest about this, why this, this is happening. This should be easy for you to answer. It I've should be very it. easy for you to answer. What was the company that generated £8 million? I've pounds answered that allowed... it. Rock with... Services. But Rock, Rock Services is not a trading company. Well, they... we're going to have to agree to differ on that. I think I know my so what, business what, okay. affairs better than you. What does Rock Services do that generates Rock that kind services of money? Rock Services has all sorts of revenue. It generates some uh, All sorts of revenue? Income. What kind of revenue? We insure half a million people in the UK and... Andrew. Rock we services. Turn over Rock services itself million. insures half a million people. There's a, it's a group of companies. I know it's complex for journalists to understand. It's not complex. It's, it's very complex. It's just complex. That it looks like a company which well, doesn't generate sorry. that kind of money. As far as I'm concerned, I've given you the answer to the question. We know what this is about. This is about undermining Article 50. It's undermining the Brexit result, and it's a collection of very vicious Labour MPs that have grouped together with the Guardian and uh, mm. FT to try to undermine Brexit. We've, we've provided the bank statements to you. You say they're, they're redacted. You've provided well. Rock Holdings bank statements. Rock Holdings You haven't shows provided us with detailed right. sales, the ins and outs of money right. going to Rock, Rock Services, Hol Rock which Holdings. is crucial. No, it's crucial that it was reported that Rock Holdings was the source of donation. We've said no money went into Rock Services or very, uh, Rock Holdings or very limited amounts, and now you're saying, well, we must know the source of it. Rock Services. No, I'm asking is the you the source. source of the money that went into Rock Services. It's a UK company that generated the cash, and we'll be able to evidence okay. that e easily. There is no evidence of that kind of money in Rock Services accounts. So right, we you, have looked I, for sorry, in companies' I'm house. I'm sorry, it's what you're saying is wrong. So the company's house re I'm returns. I'm saying what are wrong. you're saying is your understanding of it is wrong. But you know, we're, we're at the point now, aren't we, where you know we we know the Electoral Commission have got a bias on mm. this. The chairman has called it. A collection of nonsense. The MPs are biased. The Financial Times well, is hold biased. On a second. Everybody is biased well, against you. Well, it's the remaining part of the equation. It's 52 versus 48. It's beginning to sound a bit like a conspiracy theory. Well, the MPs committee is terribly biased against you. They're all dreadful remainers. The Electoral Commission are the yeah. same. I don't know what you think. The National Crime Agency are biased against you as well. I don't well. think they are, and I think they're going to see it for what it is. But I go back to what the Electoral Commission said when their own case enforcement officer said you shouldn't be opening up a case on press mm. speculation. You told Parliament yep. that Rock Services was just a service company. You've told me something well, I, very different you, I, today. I haven't seen the I'm actual transcript of, of that. I will go back and look at that. But I'm telling you that the source of the funding was Rock Services. Well, um, one of the things the Electoral Commission says is that you've yeah. kept changing your story. Why well, do you keep changing your story? I don't think we have. We just expa we expanded on it, gave the advice. You know, well, for, first of all, you said it came from me. Then you said it came from Rock Services. It has come from me. I am Rock Services. The you are Rock belong Services. to me. You know, I'm a UK taxpayer. The source of my funding, as long as it's legitimate and it's in the UK, is legitimate. So, do you own Rock Holdings? Can I ask you? Uh, yes. You are you are the main shareholder yes. and also the owner of Rock Holdings. Yes. And Rock Holdings has no connection Andrew, with the money. It's a group of insurance businesses that I own. Yeah. I don't know how to be any plainer than that. Right, but so, so show us the Leave.eu accounts in that case. Can you do that? Um, I, yeah, the Leave.eu accounts have been given to the Electoral Commission. They've, they've opined on our spending. Well, they've been through it. We, in fact, the, in fact the Electoral Commission actually said that our loan structure was not wholly untransparent in their findings. What does it's not wholly untransparent mean, Andrew? A bit opaque, possibly, I don't know. It's not wholly untransparent. That means right. it's transparent. Let's go right back to the beginning again. Okay, let's, and ask do you, that. let's do that. So there is this company, yeah. Rock Services, which you say is a no, massive I'm insurance not gonna, company. By the way, massive no, insurance no, no. company which not, can generate I'm, £8 million of spare gonna cash. I'm not going to circle back. I've made my position crystal clear. You disagree with that position. You know, the FT and Guardian it's not disagree. It's just, I don't, do. I, I mean, we've looked at this. We don't see how rock yeah. services can generate eight well, million are, quid. Are we, are we not at the position where the Electoral Commission have referred it? We will explain ourselves and the accounting that went behind it. 
and I'm very happy with that. Well, it's not just us. The, the DCMS Select Committee says oh, yes. it is unclear yeah. where Aaron Banks obtained this money. Yeah. He failed to satisfy us that his own donations had, in fact, yeah. come from sources within well, the let's UK. Let's talk about real politics. You know, the Electoral Commission sat on this for five months. We, we've had no allegations put to us by the Electoral Commission, no correspondence in five months. They're due up in front of the committee on Tuesday, and what's going to happen is they're going to say, oh, well, it's not any of our business anymore. It's now over to the National Crime Agency, aren't they? You, you, for five months you without any correspondence. You were about the Electoral Commission. Right well, I, I, you said, rightly bite so. me. You said, bite rightly me, and they so. bit you. They haven't bitten me. They've they're bitten, they've bitten they've they're, the NCA. Look, it, it, if you thought about the number of corrupt politicians that have sat in this chair over the years, um, you have to say, what is the Electoral Commission? Well, it's on. a bunch of ex-MPs from the SNP, Liberal see, I'm Party. Sorry, this is what you I'm do. sorry. But this is what you do. What do when you mean, you, this is when what you, I do? When, you, when people ask you questions, you smear other people, say they're all corrupt, they're all dreadful. I'm sorry, how, the, can, the it be right for our dem how can it be right for our democracy to be overseen by former ex-politicians and MPs? How can it be right for how our... How can it be right? How can it be good for our democracy when you respond to criticisms by Damien Collins, no. who's chair of that committee, yeah. A Conservative MP by writing to his constituents, calling yep. him a snake in the grass. Well, he is. <laughs> you say you Frankly. write to every one of his constituents. This is, yeah. That is old fashioned, straightforward bullying, isn't it? No, it's not. I mean, straightforward bullying, by the way, is The Guardian blackmailing a, a, a researcher of Isabel Oakeshott. And actually, then Lord Ashcroft had to fly over to New Zealand. Of all the New things Zealand. I want to talk about, so, Isabel Oakeshott is down at the bottom <laughs> of my list. I'm sure but, it is. What I, what but, I do you know, want to ask you about I mean, is today's I've, Observer story, right, okay. where, where it is suggested there's been a great tranche of emails come out of Eldon Insurance, your insurance yeah. company in Bristol, yeah. which show that people were working there both for the insurance yeah. company and for Leave.eu. So, was that reported? Now, I can say that was reported to the Electoral Commission, and people, were, people that did work uh, from Eldon were transferred over on short term contracts legally, and then it was reported through the Electoral Commission in the right way. This is where a lot of this confusion comes from. But you're talking about emails that were stolen from us, and you say you don't well, want to talk about Isabel uh, I, I Isabel really, I really don't. I know you don't, because the guy was blackmailed and had to I, be well, flown I, back I, to I, Australia. I, I, I want to ask you one other thing, I've got however, a lovely bit here is, from the BBC, there, there is by a, the way. There is a quote. There is a quote in today's Sunday Times from you saying that you regret voting for Leave, that if you had your time over again, you'd vote Remain. Is that true? Well, I think what I said was that the corruption I've seen in British politics, the sewer that exists, and the disgraceful behaviour of the government over what they're doing with Brexit and how they're selling it out, mm -hmm. means that if I had my time again, I, I think we would have been better to probably remain and well, not unleash these demons. OK, Aaron Banks, now thank you very much you. indeed. The Oscar-winning director Steve McQueen is one of the foremost filmmakers in the last decade. Twelve Years a Slave and Hunger were commercial hits, which managed to stay true to McQueen's unique artistic vision. A former Turner Prize winner, his is a constantly inventive body of work. Widows is his new film, a heist movie with a moral message. It was inspired by the 1980s series in which a team of women take on a robbery that their dead husbands had planned. When I met up with Steve McQueen, I asked him if his big screen version was in danger of glamorising violent crime. Our husbands aren't coming back. We're on our own. husband left me the plans for his next job. All I need is a crew to pull it off. Why should we trust you anyway? Because I'm the only one standing between you and a bullet in your head. Everyone's trying to survive right now. I mean, it's not, it's not the best time to be a human being, unfortunately. Not to say they should, but everyone should pick up a gun or you know, rob a bank or, 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 or whatever. I mean, of course, it's, it's, this, 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 this is fiction. But when someone has a, a situation where they are saying that they'll rather take, they'll take your life or you have to do X or Y or Z, you have to make the decision on what you're going to do, either allow something to happen to you or do something about it. Uh, there's a very sad moment in the film, I find it a very difficult moment, when there's a preacher who gives this wonderfully moving sermon about bringing love back into society, and then we learn that he too is corrupt, everybody's corrupt, it's quite a bleak view of modern America, or maybe modern Western society. Yeah, I mean, we're all, dis we're all been disappointed with, with people that we believed in. Um, there are all these false prophets and false sort of uh, um, politicians. It's kind of interesting that right now we have to re rely on ourselves. I mean, it's the only way, really. I mean, and also it's about people because you have these four women who are from different backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds, different social backgrounds. They've come together to make uh, a team and to sort of take take power. I think that's what we have to do as individuals today. We got to start thinking like professionals. We're in business together. 
There's not gonna be some cozy reunion. After this job, we're done. We have three days to look and move like a team of men. The best thing we have going for us is being who we are. Why? Because no one thinks we have the balls to pull this off. You got your big break as a boy because you could draw. Yes. And you went to art college. Yes. And then you went on very quickly to make art films. Yeah. What's the relationship between those films and what you learned as a filmmaker for art galleries and museums and so forth going into the big time for the big Hollywood film? Yeah. Is there any relationship? Well, they, they, they both complement each other. There's no difference for me. I don't really sort of... Uh, again, it's like writing poetry and, and, and writing a novel. That, you know, one is a, a condensed, uh, um, abstract, uh, fractured poetry, and one is the yarn, which is the novel. So yeah. this, one is storytelling and, and one is sort of abstract. Do you, do you distinguish in any way between commercial filmmaking and art? No, no. Um, no not at all. I don't know what the difference is, really. Mm. Uh, I suppose currency, but in the art world is horrendously about money these days, the contemporary art world is just, yeah, what's that a story? Um, mm. No, it's, I mean, again, I, it's, it's, it's a good question, it's a bloody good question. Listen, I suppose in some ways, um, what I love about film is the democracy of film. Yeah. That you pay your whatever money, you walk in, you pay it, you leave, anyone can come and see it. You've chosen to live and bring your family up in Amsterdam, so you've also got an interesting perspective on, on Brexit. And you've talked about the difference in atmosphere in Amsterdam. I'll tell you a story. So um, I was bringing my son to school, and it was a day of Brexit, morning of Brexit. And a friend of mine came up to me and he was crying. And I said, what's going on? I said, he said, Steve, I said, look, this Brexit thing, I don't want our sons to go to war. I, I really don't. This is the starting of something. It was kind of emotional. And I was shocked by it. I was, of course, I was very upset. Yeah, people thought, oh, he's, 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 he's over the top, come on. How many things have we still spoken about recently which have been over the top would have come to fruition? Well, I hope it's wildly over the top. Yeah, we'll mm. wait and see, but you, mm. you, you see the cracks. This is a breakup of you, 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 you. You see what happened to, you know, you know Merkel recently was sort of stepping down. I mean, what, what, so, what's so the situation? We're living through a wild, wild time at the moment. Oh, uh, we're and living through, I don't know I what we're living through. We're living through greed. We're living through, I mean, look at London. I mean, me going to work, I'm living in London for eight, eight, six months to go to work. Going through Mayfair, you know, skipping over the homeless guy, you know, navigating my way through the sort of, you know, the the the, the addict, you know, people are de it's desperate times. People that used to be like knife crime, it's desperate. It's this is, you know, you think you think people want to go out and stab people? You think, oh, you know what? I want to do drugs and I want to stab people. No, this is a situation. It's the environment which has caused a certain situation to occur. And look at London. London is a rich person's playground. I mean, how can you afford to live in London? I mean, and, it's crazy. And do you think a lot of the lessons that come from this film about black people living in Chicago are applicable to black people living in London as well? It is, in a sense, it's the same kind of set of circumstances. It's about Latinos living in Americans. It's about Ukrainians living in Americans. It's about the old guard, the Irish Americans, Italian Americans. All of these different sort of circumstances, as far as religion is concerned in Chicago, as race and whatnot is concerned in Chicago, it's all about that. So it's it's not just about you know you talk about knife crime. Well, you talk about knife crime. You talk yeah. about it's, there's young white people in, involved in black crime too. I mean, it was trying to push all kinds of stuff. So you know, yeah. it's about young people and desperateity and, and a lack of an idea of a future. Steve, it's been quite a journey, yeah. and you're now one of the most successful filmmakers in the world at the moment. Do you know what's coming next? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I'm, I'm I want to do a musical. A musical. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, I want to make myself happy. Want to get, let's get happy. I mean, right now, listen, it's it's dark. It's it's heavy. There's no, I mean, there's no ifs, buts, or babies about it. I mean, it's so I'm sure, so uncertain. I think sometimes you just shake off the blues. You know, you just shake it up. You know, and you know, make yourself happy. Steve McQueen there, and Widows goes on general release in cinemas this Tuesday. I'm joined now by the Cabinet Minister in charge of Housing and our Communities, James Brokenshire. Welcome, Mr. Brokenshire. Hello, you, Andrew. You heard Aaron Banks there. I think the narrative has shifted a bit again. If, if it was judged by the National Crime Agency that something serious had gone wrong in the funding of the Brexit referendum, what would that mean for the referendum? Well, I think, I think it's very difficult for me to comment on something that is very firmly a live investigation, a live criminal investigation. As a government, we are getting on with the delivery of the referendum. 17 million people voted for us to leave the EU. That is what we're seeking to execute to get that deal and make sure that happens. But if money had, as I say again, if, if money had come from abroad, from, from illegitimate sources, 
and was influential in that referendum. Would that not undermine the whole validity of the referendum? Well, again, I think we need to ensure this investigation takes its course. But as I understand it, Mr Banks was not associated with the main Leave campaign. That obviously the public voted for us to leave the European Union. That is what we are taking forward as a government, making sure that happens and delivering on the Brexit referendum. I'm going to ask you a bit more about Brexit in a moment, mm. but before I do, can I ask about the very sad news that Jeremy yeah. Hayward has died of lung cancer, and of course you suffered from lung cancer yeah. and knew Jeremy Hayward well. Yes. Just reflect a little bit on his importance. I mean, he's not the kind of person who comes and sits on these chairs or the no. public sees much of, but he was a crucial figure from the Blair years all the way through to now. Jeremy was an outstanding public servant, some would say the public servant of his generation, heading up the civil service, working within the civil service around three decades, serving four prime ministers with absolute distinction. And I think it was the fact of his leadership, his intellect, but also his good humour and his kindness and his ability to be able to deal with some of the most complex issues of our time and how he will be so sadly and so sorely missed and our condolences and thoughts very much go to Suzanne, his wife, his children and the rest of his family. Thank you. Are we close to a, a deal on the Brexit exit, do you think? Well, we want to get that deal. We're obviously working hard to see that that happens. Negotiations are still very firmly continuing and therefore we are 95% of the way there in relation to the withdrawal agreement, obviously still having this issue in relation to the insurance arrangements for Northern Ireland and Ireland and that very much remains our focus and attention in getting that deal. How is it possible for the government to lose one of its most popular ministers, Tracy Crouch, the sports minister, over these gambling machines? Why did you decide as a government to hang on for another six months these are terribly addictive machines. People are killing themselves up and down the country. Tracy Crouch actually had met the mother of somebody who had killed themselves because of a gambling addiction. And yet you managed to lose her. It was complete incompetence, wasn't it? Well, I'm obviously very sorry to see Tracy leave the government. She is an uh, you know, outstanding uh, colleague, someone who's worked very hard and very passionate about the issues that she believes in. But what I would say is that actually we were called on to introduce these arrangements prior to April 2020. We brought that forward to deliver this in October 2019, recognising that we need to do this. We need to bring these states but you down still and really respond. For another six months. Well, she no, says that, in that's... her resignation letter, two people will tragically take their lives every day due to gambling-related problems, and for that reason, as much as any other, I believe this delay is unjustifiable. How well, could she be wrong? We want to see this delivered effectively for all of the good reasons that Tracy identifies. But it's wrong to say that there's been a delay. We had not committed to introducing on a particular day. We'd been called on to introduce it before April 2020. We are doing that. We want to see this introduced properly and effectively so that we can actually make the difference in this and area. Just, she was the minister in charge of this and she uses the word delay, so it's quite hard to see how it wasn't a delay. And she says, from the time of the announcement to reduce the stakes and its implementation, over £1.6 billion will be lost on these machines, a significant amount of money in our most deprived constituencies. And again, she's right about this. Well, it's, it's right that we recognise the need for change. That's what the government is doing. That's why we're implementing this. We want to do this right. We want to do this properly. That's why we're bringing this into effect next October to respond and recognise the need and actually doing that speedier than some others were calling on us to do so that we can make the difference in people's lives in the way that we need to. You've got a, an initiative on the high streets at the moment. Now, high streets are being uh, undermined and hollowed out by our general enthusiasm for online shopping, mm. as you yeah, know. Yeah, the high streets are changing. And, and so you see, you know, boarded up shop after boarded up shop after boarded up shop. Can government really change the look of these high streets? What are you going to do? Are you going to have to slash business rates, encourage small businesses? What are you going to do? We need to make a difference on a number of different fronts. In the budget this week, we announced a 675 Future High Streets Fund to innovate, to see mm. how local councils can really support the high streets. Also, bringing down business rates over the next two years for around, a, uh, you know, around by about a third. But it's also about what we need to do on some of these empty vacant shops, how we can turn these over into community hubs, actually bring them back into use. The benefit actually that has for both landlords and communities and therefore taking action on a number of different fronts as well as people getting people to live in the high streets too. Sure. So that it's actually creating footfall and making our high streets viable and positive, recognising that the digital environment is changing the way that we shop, the way that we do business, and us needing to respond to that clearly on all fronts. 
a bit of a row at the moment between the BBC and the government over bu budget coverage. Can I ask you directly, in terms of the poorest people in the country, the bottom 10%, and the richest people in the country, the top 10%, who is getting the most cash benefit from the budget? Well, proportionately, those, on the, low, on, proportionally, those on the lower end have actually gained the most from this budget in terms of lowering the thresholds over taxation, but also and in in increasing, increasing, the, increasing the actual numbers that are there in terms of, for example, the national living wage. So the benefit proportionately okay. is very firmly there. Proportionally, but in cash terms? Well, it, it, I don't think you actually measure this in cash well, terms. Well, the IFS it's, has, helpfully. Well, the, in, the IFS, unimpeachable, not a left-wing source or anything like that, says our estimate is that the poorest 10% of people gain £50 per annum from this budget, while the richest 10% gain £280 from the budget. So in cash terms, the, the richest 10% do get more than the poorest 10%. But it, it's, why I, come quite, quite but it's why I come back to the point about proportion, the, the different proportions in terms of where you start off and therefore the benefit and impact of what people receive, which is why I do make the point about how this was a budget for those on low incomes, the benefit that will provide, and actually the real support through taxation, through the national living wage, and therefore this very firmly being a budget for those on low incomes. The British people are less concerned with proportions than cash, I suspect, James Brooke and Shabbat. Thank you very much indeed for talking to us. Now, thanks to all my guests. Next week, it is Remembrance Sunday, and we're on at 9 o'clock here on BBC One. Hurrah! We leave you now, however, with the most celebrated song from possibly the greatest musical ever written, Porgy and Bess is on an English national opera right now. The remaining opera performances, I'm afraid, are sold out. But Nadine Benjamin is also singing Musetta in La Boheme at the ENO from the 26th of November. Nadine is here and she's accompanied by Martin Fitzpatrick, head of music at the ENO. Here is summertime. Goodbye. Thank you.